Okay, our next speaker is Ms. Brianna Locke, three-dimensional printing in organ transplantation. My name is Brianna Locke, and I will be presenting today on three-dimensional printing and organ transplantation, and thank you all for coming. I'm really stoked to talk about this. So. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, where 3D printing began, um, really like what it entails, um, and then I'm going to be talking about organ transplantation, um, what it is, um, how long people kind of stay on the wait list, and then I'm going to talk about how the two come together and really um, how they work together and how surgeons can use 3D printing in the organ transplantation process. Okay, so 3D printing began in 1984, and it was founded by Charles Hull, and it was originally founded for prototyping. So basically what he wanted to do was create prototyping faster for industries, and he wanted to be able to uh, come up with an idea and be able to print something out so that he could bring it out to people and bring it out to industries quicker. Um, so that's what he did. I'm just gonna... Okay. Uh, so that's what he did in 1984. But there was a split in the latter 2000s, and really the prototyping industry stayed where it was, but then there was this split, and it really became really important for aeronautical... Uh, aeronautical prototyping, and also for the medical industries, and 3D printing really grew, and it just like exploded, and now it's used pretty much everywhere. You can see it in schools, and you see it, even kids are using it now. Um, the picture to your right is what the first 3D printer kind of looked like, and uh, the computer next to it, um, obviously the computers have changed a lot too, so that's just kind of an idea of what it looked like. So the process of 3D printing is pretty difficult. Um, you can have different ink types, such as plastic, um, liquid inks, um, and even cartilage and living human tissue. So basically, if you have a plastic, such as ABS or PLA plastic, it has to get melted in order to create a solid. Um, so these plastics get melted at 70 degrees Celsius or 230 degrees Celsius, which is a pretty high uh, temperature. Um, and that all happens in the printer head, which you can see to your left. Um, what happens here is um, cartilage can be mixed with a um, biodegradable plastic, and it can be put into the printer head, and a solid, or the liquid is ejected through the printer head into the gradient, and then a solid is what is created. Basically, it works as a regular printer, but it lays the ink in successive layers, and so a solid will be made in the end. Um, and there's very meticulous equations that go into this, that whoever is working on the, um, who's working on the computer end, needs to mess with these equations in order for the solid to come out exactly how you want it. Basically, it takes into account temperature, density, momentum, and other different things. Um, and so if you're taking a 3D file from a, from a or a 2D file, excuse me, um, from the computer, and you put that into the 3D printer, uh, somebody needs to manipulate these equations and make sure that the solid is gonna come out perfectly because these drips are gonna be coming out from the printer head. And if one thing comes out wrong, your whole um, solid is going to be messed up. And if you're gonna be printing later on, as I'm going to discuss, um, tissues and organs or even um, different uh, models for surgeries, everything needs to be perfect. If, some, if one thing is wrong, then, I mean, there could be consequences in the end. So all of these different equations need to be manipulated perfectly. So now I'm going to move on to organ transplantation. So the human body has 12 different organ systems, uh, taking up basically like, you know, your respiratory system, your integumentary system, etc. These 12 organ systems work together in order to keep a human alive. If one organ isn't working properly, the whole body starts to basically fail. So for example, if your kidney starts to shut down, it's gonna cause different problems. If your heart starts to fail, you, ca you are gonna start having problems with your lungs, which eventually is gonna lead to complete body shutdown. To the right, I have a chart. Um, this chart shows as of April 13th, 2017, so this was just last month, how many people in Arizona are currently on the organ transplant list. 
Uh, for a kidney, there are currently 1,700 people waiting f uh, in Arizona, and for a heart, there are 59 people. So who gets to decide who gets an organ? Who gets one first? Why should I get a heart before somebody else? Um, this is not just one person deciding this. This is many people, many equations, different things that go in to it. So basically, um, there are a set of formulas that everybody who gets put on the transplant list have to go through. There is one called the Estimated Post-Transplant Survival Formula. Everybody who gets put on the list has to go through this formula. And this basically will take into account whether they've already had an organ transplant, if they have diabetes, um, if they've been on dialysis, which is for your kidneys. Um, and they will put all this into the formula, which you can do on the UNOS website. Um, and it changes day by day, so you can put all of this information into the website and then a number will populate. This number will be uh, compared to other people on the transplant list, and then your number will kind of pop up. There's another formula for liver transplants, and it's called the Model for End-Stage Liver Disease. And this uh, looks at people who need a liver and how long they will live with their current liver for three months. So if I can live with my liver for 15 days, but the person next to me can only live with their liver for 10 days, they're gonna be placed higher on the list than I am. So that's kind of how the transplant list works. So now I'm gonna talk about how 3D printing and organ transplant works together because they're so different. So how do these two things work? So basically 3D printing has two roles when it comes to organ transplant. It works as a pre-planning tool and it can also be made for like creating these different tissues and these different organs. Um, the picture to the right shows um, a scan of an ear. The middle one shows like uh, the printed version of this ear and then the final product that is being implanted onto a person. So this is kind of the model that I'm going to show you on the next slide. So as I said, 3D printing can be used as a pre-planning tool, pre-transplant. So basically what surgeons and researchers are doing with uh, 3D printing is they are taking CT scans, MRI scans, and they are creating these 2D images and making them 3D models so that surgeons can touch and feel the organs that they are either going to be taking out or putting into these patients. This is allowing patient or surgeons to not only foresee problems that could happen during surgery, but it's cutting down surgery time, decreasing blood loss, and making the overall surgery so much easier on the patient and the physician. Basically, if somebody's giving, getting a liver transplant, it's a very long surgery. It could take 12 to 16 hours. They need lots of blood during surgery. It could take up to 12 units of blood, and they could... Um, have many problems with their hepatobiliary system. So what surgeons do with these 3D models is they can see the vasculature and they can see if these patients have any clots already, they can see if they have any problems before surgery and they can uh, foresee any problems and they can pretty much plan out the surgery before it happens to where if they don't have these models, they kind of go in blind and the surgery can take longer, the patient can lose more blood. So that's what the models can do. Um, also, these models are allowing surgeons to do transplants that they've never been able to do before. There was a three-year-old girl in the UK last year who received a kidney transplant from her father. A kidney transplant from an adult to a child had never been done before this surgery. Um, surgeons took a 3D model of the child's abdomen and used a 3D model of the dad's kidney and kind of um, saw how the kidney was gonna fit in with her organs, you know, to make sure that nothing was gonna get crushed. And without this 3D technology, that transplant could have never been done. And so it really shows like what this technology can do. Um, this is really the, the forefront of my presentation, and that is 3D printers creating organs and creating viable tissues. The future of 3D printing is printing bone, printing tissue, printing skin, and eventually being able to print hearts, print lungs, so that the organ transplant list is diminished completely. Um, the picture that you see here, um, the one uh, more to the left, that is bone, and the one to the far right is the ear that I was kind of talking about. 
So basically, um, cartilage is mixed with a biodegradable plastic so that um, it can be attached to a human and not really you know, like hurt them at all. And that ink is put into the printer, the file is put into the system, and the solid comes out as an ear made with real cartilage or real skin cells. Another thing that the 3D printer can be used for is skin. Skin grafts are very painful for patients, causes a lot of infection risk and a lot of bleeding. And so um, 3D printers can use real living skin cells, real stem cells, and can create skin for patients um, so that they don't have to go through a skin graft. It's really amazing. Also, um, in Russia in 2015, they were able to 3D print a thyroid gland for a mouse and implant this thyroid gland into the mouse and the mouse is still living and the thyroid gland is still producing hormones. So that shows that we are in the next step of this 3D printing, uh, this 3D printing technology and that organs are next. It's really exciting. Um, so this is a bioprinter. So this is the kind of printer that would be needed to create this cartilage and create this um, these kind of tissues that I'm talking about. Um, this printer is about two to three feet long. It's quite large, and this would run about $250,000 plus. Um, but when you're talking about somebody's life, that's nothing. Um, so I'm going to show a really short clip just kind of to um, show like what bioprinting is all about. Organovo creates functional human tissues with its unique bioprinting technology. Starting with cells from any source, Organovo's bioprinter precisely places a specially formulated bio-ink, in this case, into a 96-well plate for drug discovery. The process results in a complex tissue with natural architecture. Disease can be induced and disease progression can be studied in the native microenvironment. For medical research and drug discovery, potential treatments can be observed real time to measure safety, efficacy, and mechanism of action. 3D bioprinting can create more natural cell cell interactions than traditional 2D methods with better predictive value and higher clinical relevance. This revolutionary technology can speed safe and effective drug development, providing an entirely new way to study disease and advance medical research, and ultimately, create a potential new source of tissues for surgery and transplant medicine. Organova, changing the shape of medical research and practice. Um, so like I said, this 3D technology will be the future of medicine and will be the foreground of all transplants. 22 people die every single day waiting for um, an organ, and I think that 3D printing can end this and can really change that and can change that number to be one or zero. I currently work at Mayo Clinic Arizona where last year they completed over 300 transplants including heart, lung, kidney, pancreas, and liver. And I am going to school at Grand Canyon University where I'll be a senior next year um, pursuing a medical career where I hope to be a heart and lung transplant surgeon. I hope to be using this 3D technology one day. And uh, thank you for your time. Yeah. I would probably assume so. Um, it would depend on if they used stem cells and if they used their own cells, because if you used your own cells, you wouldn't need the anti-rejection meds. The anti-rejection meds are solely because you're using somebody else's antibodies and somebody else's organs, so that's why you're on the anti-rejection meds. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. <laughs>